There's seemingly increasing consensus that the approval of the Bitcoin spot ETF will be a classic sell the news event. I'm not sure that I agree, but Kathy Wood said so. Quite a few analysts says so. And a lot of people are pointing to the fact that institutions are largely positioned already as if the approval is guaranteed and will take profit if we see a move to the upside on that approval. We're going to discuss that and everything happening with the ETF, which is now only 13 days away, 13 days away from that date that everybody's been talking about, January 10th. I've got Eric Balchunas from Bloomberg here to discuss the man who's become an absolute rock star on crypto, crypto Twitter as a result of this uh, Bitcoin spot ETF saga that we've all been uh, experiencing for the past six to nine months. And we've got chart guys at the end, of course, to discuss everything happening with the markets. Let's go. Let's go. What is up, everybody? I'm Scott Melker, also known as the Wolf of All Streets. Before we get started, please subscribe to the channel and hit that like button. I'm just going to go ahead and bring Eric on right now so we can talk about ETF Palooza. We're in the home stretch here, man. It's uh, You probably haven't slept in a year, feels like. <laughs> it's, it's a, it, it is exhausting, but it's also just wildly fascinating. So I guess my, my juice is flowing. Uh, some of us analysts uh, just have been obsessed with it. Um, so, but yeah, it's exhausting. Well, I would say that ETFs in my experience have never been quite this much in the spotlight for a single asset, right? Have you ever seen, you know, 12, 13, 14 filers awaiting at the same time on the same date, potentially the approval of something for a brand new asset class? Or is this really a unicorn situation? No. Yeah, this is a unicorn or a one of one situation. First of all, just the idea that ETFs only break into a new asset class once a decade. So to me, this is sort of like, um, I don't know, an eclipse. If I was a weatherman, this would be like an eclipse or Haley's Comet. It's just a rare situation that just really gets your attention because it's different than the normal cloudy, rainy, sunny weather thing you're used to covering all the time. This is a scientific marvel. And so that's one thing. Number two is they've never had uh, multiple ETFs launched on the same day that do the same thing. We've never had a complete fair horse race. The only other one that was like this was um, the Ether futures, but we'll call those a really, really boring undercard. The gold ETF, which is probably the closest parallel, that launched alone. So GLD launched, became you know a big deal. And it be, it's still a big deal. It's still the most traded gold ETF to this day. That having that little bit of head start it really helps. And we've seen that over and over. First to market is everything. This is a literal race, which is why we're dubbing it the Kentucky Derby, because it literally <laughs> reminds me of the Kentucky Derby. At some point, we may even have odds, you know, two to one, four to one, eight to one. Um, we've already, it was on Yahoo yesterday, and they asked me for my favorites, my long shots, and my dark horse. And I, totally obliged um so yeah this is this is really really different exciting um and that's why i spent so much uh, time and brain power on it but that said it's go only going to be one or two percent of all the etf assets so overall in my life we cover all the asset classes and sometimes obviously when we tweet about stocks or bonds um the crypto people are like hey what's up with this uh but we're etf fans. <laughs> we just happen to be really on this story like a like a dog on a bone for the past uh several months okay so we've obviously tracked your predictions at one point it was 75 percent at the to the end of the year grayscale one it went to 90 percent by january 10th end of the year semantics right 10 days and even since you gave that prediction 90 percent chance we've now seen endless examples of the sec proactively working with these filers BlackRock meeting, ARC meeting, everybody meeting with the SEC to argue over whether it's going to be in kind or cash, all these things, right? So is there any reason to believe that the SEC would expend all of these resources, spend all this time if they weren't taking this seriously? Absolutely not. I was on Yahoo with a lawyer yesterday who's working with many of the issuers. And that was his point. You, you're just not going to have the SEC working uh, during the week between Christmas and New Year's unless... SHIT is going down. That's just the way it is. They're not. This is the government, remember? So, yeah. 
Um, and everything we heard with the issuers who are dealing with them look very good. I mean, basically, I mean, again, I don't have it recorded, right? But I've heard they told people, you do X, Y, and Z, you're good. We're ready. I mean, that's what they've said. So we're not from 90%. Um, I'm just saying it's an optimistic 90%. Uh, we were we were at ninety percent when it was hard to be. Yeah, 90%. That, that's and, what I'm saying. It was not you were ninety yeah. percent just on the grayscale winning a court case against the SEC without yeah. seeing any of this actual. And movement. We were seventy five before that, so we really yeah. stuck our neck out there because we had really worked some sources, some back channel information, um, and again, our in house lawyer gave us good odds in the grayscale. Uh, our in house legal analyst, rather, that was helpful. Um, and so, yeah, uh, there's no reason to up it. The only 10, the 10% really, I'd say a couple of that is a denial. Again, very, very large outside shot. This would be the ultimate mind F rug pull of all time. And it would go down in history as like, what? Um, but it's possible, I guess. The five, and the SEC would get sued. <laughs> Beyond, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, at this point, our 90% is not only looking better, but many uh, mainstream media sites have actually just reported on it's really high odds. So we're now covered completely. If they rug pulled, everybody would be shocked. Not just, you know, if if they denied it like a month ago, only we would look bad because <laughs> we were yeah. the only one who was optimistic. Now everybody is. So everybody would look like fools. Um, now the other 6% is more for a delay. Like, let's just say, I don't know, there's some kind of legal technicality and they just say, hey, Ark, can you withdraw, refile, and, and we'll look to approve you and everybody on the BlackRock approval date in March. That's right. maybe a, a possibility. So my point is if we, if for some reason they delay it, our 90% would just curve up. But again, I don't see any reason for that. Everything we've heard is they're going to, the latest we heard, and here's what I would, here's the dates that we're looking at, the strongest dates, approval on the 8th, that's a Monday, right? So after the weekend, and then launched by that Thursday, that would be the 11th. The Is 12th. there a chance that you okay. could see like these 19B4 approvals, but the S1's not cleared, and you could see a bigger gap than that three days between when we actually yeah, see this that was first some approval, theories not we, a we heard being uh, trotted around, even from one issuer, uh, two issuers. Um, the guy from um, Matt Hogan said it from Bitwise uh, on my show. So yeah, yeah, no, no, it was the other guy though, Stephen McClurg, who really was like, "Hey, the government's operate, slow. Yeah. This is going to be February." I don't agree with that. At the time, he made sense, but what happened since then is the S ones all got updated like crazy. In fact, the details in the S one is next level. And in fact, all the meetings they've had at the SEC where they said, "Stop trying to sell us on in kind. Do it cash." The S ones immediately reflect that they refile. BlackRock's had three or four amendments. And the detail, the level of detail in the S1s is so high. What on earth would they need? The S1 argument waiting till February would be stronger if there were no amendments. But we've had three or four amendments per issuer at this point. So what I think is going to happen is this. Um, the 19B4s are being uh, finalized. The SEC is going to eyeball them, wait till their approval match. Like they're going to write their approval, match it with the 19B4. Once they're fine and happy and they have nothing else they need from your 19B4, the 19B4s will be refiled. When we see those refiled, that's almost ipso facto approval from what I'm hearing. Then the formal approval will be written or come out on the 8th or 9th. That's what we're hearing. And then the launch, again, we've heard nothing that would say it would take weeks. We heard days. So we think 11th, 12th, possible it waits till after Martin Luther King birthday, which is the next long weekend. But the 11th would be ideal because you get them out, get two days of trading, let everybody have a breather for three days, and then come back in the next week. That, I think, is the most likely scenario. But again, um, it's not definite. Having 12 to 14 of these launch at once, what do you think the marketing campaigns in that battle for AUM is going to look like? You talked about <laughs> earlier already that being first is huge. So if nobody gets that first mover advantage... How is and are we going to see one or two winners? Are we going to see like an even spread? I don't think that's going to be the case among twelve. I don't think that's the case when you have a Fidelity and a uh, BlackRock and Arc in the mix. But I, I mean, you've got to imagine this is going to be like the most widespread marketing campaign in history. We even saw a big marketing campaign for the Ether's futures ETFs, which fell flat. But ahead of the approval on Friday, which the approvals came Monday, we saw ads running everywhere. Yeah, so we've seen already seen a couple ads. Um, I think we'll see a lot of ads. The only thing is the ads can't include the ticker. 
which right. makes it a little tricky. Um, but they can include a link and they can sort of subtly tell you what it is, you know, obviously. Uh, Bitwise and Hashdecks, I think, have two ads that were pretty good about saying it's an ETF at least. Um, but I think Google um, has uh, let go of some rules where you can yeah, advertise yeah. on Google. I think they're going to hit the internet hard. If I were them, I would. I just tweeted this. I would. I would advertise on Fox News, golf tournaments, and AARP, and I would put in ads that featured like, um, I don't know, the equivalent of a Bruce Springsteen, like the King of the Boomers type people, not like a. I don't think you want millennials, to millennials don't need this. They'll buy. Bitcoin. They don't need this. No, Nobody yeah. young. Everybody understands this. Who's young? I think you need to figure out how to approach the boomers. And Bitwise used the most interesting man on earth. He's clearly a boomer. And hashtags yeah. used an old clip of a. Uh, Someone talking about the internet and the boomer was like, this, this makes no sense. Um, great ads for the boomer. So um, I think that's what we'll see. I think there'll be a lot of ad spend. The, the thing about the volume is when you have these, let's say there's 12 horses that are out. I don't think that many will make the starting gate, by the way. But let's just assume like 12 make it out. Um, there's only room for one liquidity king. And the liquid king is set for life. It never has to lower its fees. It is immune from the Vanguard effect and the ETF terror dome. That's, the, that's what everybody's after. That's the holy grail here. You basically get a nice revenue stream for eternity. Now, the rest of them will then compete on fees, distribution. They'll be in a fee war, and they'll get theirs, but it'll be a harder road to revenue. That said, you, you could have the most liquid one and then have one that has more assets, believe it or not. So the real key here, the holy grail is volume. And who yeah. will be the most voluminous one? I don't know. I mean, you've got to think BlackRock has probably is the favorite. Unless, of course, they allow GBTC to convert on day one. They would bring over $150 million a day in volume. But how much of that volume would be people staying at 2% fee? They'd have to cut their fee by like, I don't know, at, at least to 70 basis points, I think, to be competitive. So that's a whole nother question, but they would bring over volume instantly and they'd have a clear advantage. So then you look at Fidelity, then you look at ARC. ARC is probably going to put some of the money from the GBTC sale eventually into ARC B. That would give it a nice boost because when you put your own money into a fund, like on day one or two, let's say BlackRock to sells from its private trust and moves money right into its ETF, that's going to show up as volume. So it's going to look like it traded like $500 million that day. And a lot of times the media doesn't pick up on what's BYOA, like volume versus like organic volume. And the key thing is to have a narrative forming around the ETF that you're the winner. So there's going to be yeah. jockeying, not only in the fees, but also they're going to place assets in volume that are, are actually fake in a way. They're, they're their own money. Um, and yeah. then, you know, then there could be one that just naturally takes off. There's, so there's we will be studying this yeah. like, it's crazy, right? Yeah, there's just no way to me in my mind, maybe I'm wrong, that Larry Fink, who's one of the most powerful 5, 10 people on the planet, you could argue, is out making a point to talk about crypto in the media if he's going to just launch this without the AOM lined up in advance. To your point, whether that's coming internally, whether he's got a whole lot of calls in to friends who say, hey, you know, just throw $100 million in this, do me a solid. I just don't see this falling flat like that Ethereum futures ETF that literally nobody wanted. Yeah, right. I look, see a lot of people point. No, we wanted that product. It was just a milestone, like stepping stone to real products. Probably BlackRock, ironically, has the most pressure here or the most natural incentive because most of the other firms in the race are privately held. And so the, the owners get there. They make plenty of money. BlackRock, I know Larry Fink's fine, but BlackRock is a publicly traded company. So they're constantly having to, what have you done for me lately? They're shareholders. And so in order for BlackRock to keep its valuation, it's trading really well. It's outperformed all the other asset manager stocks. But to keep that up there, it's got to find new revenue streams. And ESG didn't really work out. They thought this might be a new way to sell active to the masses. It didn't work. So this is really important to them. They, they want new revenue sources to appease their shareholders who need new what have you done for me lately so this the is the anti-esg it's the anti-esg larry Fink supporting bitcoin is like literally blows up et uh esg completely which he created so yeah and that's sometimes that's the rap on blackrock is they're you know more opportunistic they'll do whatever will make them money and none of that's bad i mean look it's a capitalist society i don't judge anything but you could argue that and that's what the small guys are going to do bitwise has already put etfs by crypto specialists this is a subtle way of saying 
listen, we really believe in this stuff. You're going to find ads and other ETFs from these Johnny companies who are really Wall Street opportunists. They don't care about crypto. They just want to make a buck. So there's going to definitely be uh, a barbelling, I think, between the crypto people saying we're crypto people buy our ETFs versus the, look, we're the adults in the room. You can trust us. Who cares if we're crypto people? Yeah. So listen, we need to talk. You you mentioned the GPDC sale, and I want to talk about this a bit because you also hinted at the fact that everybody might not get approved at once. GBTC might have a challenge converting. I said this actually on Monday to Dave Weisberger and James Lavish, and they pushed back very hard saying that this is all great for Grayscale, but ARK liquidated all of their GBTC. That could, that's, to some degree, that's a trade, right? Because they, the discount is closed. They've made a ton of money on it. They're rebalancing. Yeah. But they moved it as, this is your tweet, right? They moved a lot of that into BITO, which... Nobody really wants to own the futures ETF right now. So it seems like this has to be a placeholder for them to put that AUM directly into their spot ETF yeah, when it, it gets it, approved. It, it, I was just going to say, but clearly Kathy Wood is hinting at the fact you said it right here. She said uh, it could be a challenge to convert. Uh, wait, we, we have it here. Here, There are tax and regulatory uncertainties with GBTC. We don't know who will be approved. She keeps nodding to the fact, and maybe that's because they're a competitor, but that GBTC might not make it quickly here. Might not be first out of the gate with them. Yeah. There's a couple things going on in what she's saying. And that's not the first time she's hinted at GBTC possibly having a holdup. But to your point, she made a killing not only in the rise of Bitcoin, but she doubled her money in terms of GBTC discount narrowing. Now it's 5%. And with the uncertainty coming up, it's a great trade in my opinion. I would do the same thing. Also, you want to get that money prepared because if Arc B launches in 14 days or whatever, you want to stuff Arc B full of volume and assets to give it the best shot because that's going to make it appear as though a party is happening in your fund. It's a great marketing tool uh, in terms of you, you have that at your Not everybody has those assets lying around. So it's a win win for her. I think in the case of Bitto, if you've been following Arc over the years like I have, she will use big liquid stock sometimes as she legs into a smaller like biotech name. So she'll buy like, um, I don't know, Microsoft or something. Um, let me use an AI stock, like a small AI stock. She'll buy Microsoft and then use that because it's very liquid and then slowly leg into the trade because you don't want to overwhelm a small stock in volume because you'll get crushed in impact costs. So my guess is she's using Bitto as a liquidity transition tool. It's very liquid. It, um, it, I mean, it trades almost like, a, I don't know, 800 million a day or 500 million a day. That's plenty. And then she'll, I think she'll just, Hold that like she's holding Microsoft and then slowly go into ARC A or ARC B, which is the futures and the spot down the road. That's my guess. Uh, she didn't address that specifically, but I will say for people looking at her holdings, if you look at the actual percentage exposed to Bitcoin through Coinbase and GBTC and now Bitto, it's always been around 15%. Like it's always hung there. So the media sometimes will look at the actual shares sold and write a whole story. But I'm like, you have to look at the weightings. ARC is always about the weightings. And when the weightings change, that's how you know their opinion change. But the weightings have never changed. They've always kept beta to BTC at about the same level. She's literally had to sell. Uh, we've talked about it here a million times, but you, she can't let Bitcoin adjacent stocks become 75% of her portfolio. She just did. yeah, right. That's I mean, her, this is, this is how professional funds uh, manage their their AUM, but that has always been like her strategy. She never sways from her percentages and her rebalancing. Correct. Yeah, she sells the winners and then buys the losers. If a stock, if the opposite happened, let's say GBTC went down over the last six months, she'd, she'd be, be buying, buying more. Uh, but it, and then, but it wouldn't be she's more bullish on Bitcoin. She's trying to keep the ten percent weighting or whatever. I think it's a good lesson for all the uh, retail investors out there as well. But why would GBTC have any trouble converting versus the, versus the others? It is the only trust where they already have the Bitcoin sitting there. We just saw Grayscale chair Silbert, who yeah. is kind of under fire with DCG in general and, and Genesis bankruptcy. But he resigned. A lot of people saying he's stepping out of the way. Maybe this was a condition for Grayscale to be able to get approved because Barry has controversy around him. But why would this be more challenging? Does this have anything to do with the in-kind versus cash create any of that? Um, well, I read – this is just my read on it. Again, I don't have – I don't know what the conversations that went on between the SEC and Grayscale. 
But to me, this seems voluntary from Grayscale. I feel like this is a, almost like a sacrifice or an offering. Exactly. To be like, hey, we're we're being good boys. You know, we're doing the right thing. We're here. We're serious. We're trying to sort of like go legit, if you want to use like mafia terminology. Um, we're also going to put in cash creations. We're really trying to please you because th the two things that are working against them and why I think they will not make it to the starting gate, I think they'll convert eventually. I just don't think they'll go on day one. I think the SEC, after Bitto launched, Bitto still has 95% of all the volume in Bitcoin futures ETFs. The SEC does not want to play kingmaker. It wants to have a fair race. If you allow GBTC to convert on day one, they would, they would be the clear favorite by far. They'd probably win it. And they would be the king. And so I think because they have the AUM already. Just already they literally, yeah. I mean, they're holding 5% or something. They bring a gun to a knife fight. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and the SEC knows that. And I think that's why they're going to hold them back in, in the name of that now, whether in the back of their mind, and we'll never know this unless we could like drill into Gensler's brain, is whether that is really just their excuse to get back at them for suing them. Because, you know, the SEC doesn't want to prove it. You ever see Gensler's interviews? He is cagey. Yeah. He's like, he speaks in code, but he's like, yeah, w w sometimes the court makes us do things that we don't want to do. So, And then he puts out these trees, crypto's messed up. And a lot of the subtext is, look, we want no part of this. The courts, we think they're wrong. They're making us do it. I hope you're happy. We think this sucks. And I think the cash creation is also a little way to sort of stick it to the whole process because the whole industry and every investor would benefit from in-kind and the crypto world. And they won't do it. And at least they're getting cash, though. And my take is just let the genie come out of the bottle. Once the genie's out of the bottle, good things will happen. Just get what you can now. I think in kind will happen down the road. But you you know from – if you you know, you know read the tea leaves and there's an art to this. You can tell Gensler's not thrilled with this. And he probably isn't thrilled with Grayscale. Now, whether the excuse I'm saying, the fair competition, is just a way to get revenge – I don't know. Or maybe he is such a good person. He's able to separate not caring or have any like pettiness. And he really uh, feels yes, this way. Sure. Or I'm totally wrong. And they'll convert on day one. James, my colleague, who you know well, he yeah. thinks they will. We bet sushi on it. So does Nate Geraci. So I'm actually in the minority amongst the uh, my obsessed ETF analyst colleagues on this. It's going to be fun to to see what happens. Certainly, I, I think we have to. Even though I know that's not your forte or anyone's to make uh, wild price predictions or what's going to happen with price, but we're seeing this increasing sentiment. I think for many months it was like we get an approval, Bitcoin goes up like thirty thousand dollars in a week or something, right? It's just some insane, as we call it, a god candle. But now we're starting to see a lot of, I think, dampened expectation about what actually happens on the approval. Kathy Wood, again, sees short-term effect uh, of spot Bitcoin ETF as sell on news. There's a lot of articles here. Smart money, by the way, is record long on the CME, which usually means price is going down. <laughs> Not sure. up when you, when you see these goodbye longs. If you guys look at funding, and I think the market's dropping right now, across the board, everything is max long, right? I mean, shorts are just getting paid a tremendous amount of money just to exist. Uh, another analyst here, my friend, uh, my friend Ryan, I mean... Every scenario he has here basically sees us dropping after the approval. And even if you look at GLD, it went up immediately, but then had a three or four month or even longer, if I remember, sustained downtrend before that parabolic up move. Yeah, I get all these takes. I think it's also the safe take because if anybody who's a casual tourist here reads this, they're like, oh, maybe maybe I, I should be careful. Or if I buy, I, I won't be surprised if it goes down. I like that. Because I would, it would be bad for it to be too oversold. I think in 2021, when Bitto launched, nobody was saying this. Everybody was like, this rocks. This is great. It was a mania. And I don't feel that. This is a much more been there, been there, done that, once bitten, twice shy kind of feeling with this rally. That's probably a good sign for the actual rally. If everyone kind of hates it. Remember, in stocks, there was this thing called the most hated bull market ever. <laughs> and it actually helped because it, it, it really tampered everybody's like mania aspect because everybody's like, I don't know. They just had an attitude like things could go bad. And that defensive mindset actually helped the bull market rally. I don't know if the same will happen here, but I do like that these reports are coming out and everybody's like giving caution because the one thing I don't want to see is that someone comes in at the top who's like a tourist and then they, it immediately goes down. I, I hate that. And they end up holding the bag and then they leave after three months and then it goes back up That's again. Enough. And they only, they literally just had the worst trade of their life. So 
Um, I would caution that it, you know, Bitto went down after. That said, it feels different. Bitto felt like an all up mania. This feels like a somewhat hated rally. Yeah, I would say that CME and CBOE futures launched, uh, whatever it was, December 17th. That was the dead top of Bitcoin for that last cycle. And then when Bitto launched, we were in full bull mania. And that was kind of the top of that cycle. And I think a lot of people learned that lesson and think this could be the case. But I don't think there, that there just because it thing. happened with those, they're, they're very different products. It's a very different situation. And we're not in bull mania. I still don't have people asking me if they need to buy Bitcoin like they were at those points, right? Your, your barber and your Uber driver. Yeah, there's one thing we, we need to just address real quick. When these launch and people follow us on Twitter and we're putting out volume, we're going to do our best to provide perspective. But it's possible the volume numbers are much lower than Bitto. And, I mean, they're and it was a record launch yeah. for anything, right? A billion fastest to a billion. Right. Yeah. So my guess is these are th these will be one of the best, like especially as a group. They'll be one of the most successful launches ever, especially in the past 12 months. But relative to the 10-year buildup, it could feel underwhelming. And that could actually spark a sell-off, I feel like, depending on how this is phrased by people, because all people are going to have their takes on it. Um, and I think, again, remember, what we're thinking here is that the retail minnows are not nearly as hungry as they were. What's, what's in the lake right now is bigger advisor fish, but they don't bite on day one. They're going to wait to see who's the liquid, what's the cost. So the bigger fish are definitely what the, the bait is going after. I go fishing a lot. If you want minnows, you put a little cornmeal on it, you throw it in the lake, and you get a bite quickly. If you want a bigger fish, you put you put an actual medium-sized fish on the hook and throw it in, but it takes longer to get that fish to bite, and you have to go deeper. I would look at this the same way. This is going after much more medium-sized fish. I do not see a bunch of retail mania biting on day one like they did with Bitto. That could come off as underwhelming. Um, and I just want to say that's that's sort of what we feel is going to happen. I do want to say consensus still remains that regardless of what happens in the short term on the launch, that this is very bullish for the asset class long term. And I long think term, that's of course, where we should yeah. focus. Yeah, no, you're like I said, you're you're going for bigger, medium sized fish, and you're also building a bridge from one world to another. And this bridge is trusted and reliable, and the more you know, it's going to traffic will happen. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time. Always. I, I want to like book you in advance for like every day of January, if that's possible. Just get you, get you lined up the 8th, the 9th, the 10th, maybe the 14th. Can we just get it all on the books and you can show sure. up or not? Uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah, I'm sure we'll. Um, <laughs> You're going to be very, very busy, man, those days uh, on week. all these yeah, shows. I better take it easy on New Year's Eve and get rest. And yeah, rest up perfect. Yeah, well, thank you. Eric, yeah, you guys have really done an incredible job keep, keep, keeping us all abreast. It's funny, people don't realize that you're not just a crypto guy, right? There's a very small part of what you do, but we do appreciate that you've kind of taken us under your wing and explained this to us the entire way because we definitely needed the hand-holding and the bad takes are endless. No, it's great. This is a massive educational opportunity, not just for crypto people, but just anybody, investors. We're, we're learning what like creation redemption is, what you have the legal process to get an ETF file. It's wonderful, I think. The whole thing's great. Yeah, I feel like I'm a ETF mini expert just as a result of listening to you guys. So sure. I appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Have a All great right. day. See yeah, you. You too. Bye. Guys, you got, you've got to, by the way, be following Eric on, on uh, X. I'm assuming it's down in the description, uh, the, the name. But you, you have to follow. This is the way you're going to keep up. This is how I keep up. This is why we have these guys on the show. By the way, uh, you know, I see we got a lot of new people here today. If you are new to the channel, if you're one of those uh, seven and maybe a half people, subscribe. Because uh, we're here every single day. I never uh, pitch you guys to subscribe. I guess at the beginning I say like and subscribe. Do I do that? Yeah, I guess I, I, I do. But um, I'm pleading for you now. Subscribe. Because uh, we want to have you guys here for future videos. And this channel is only getting better. You can see that the quality is extremely high. We get the best guests on here. I feel like I'll drop the best guests. The, the greatest people on both sides. Uh, good people. Uh, and speaking of good people on both sides, the first side, we had our ETF uh, expert, Eric. And on the other side, we've got Dan from the Chart Guys every single Thursday. So you guys are pretty uh, comfortable here. Looks like we're actually having a little bit of a sell-off right now. I was kind of trying to click through the charts while he was talking. I see Solana's under 100 bucks, Bitcoin. A uh, little dip. I guess it's kind of right back, 42,750. But a uh, little downside here. I haven't been watching uh, stocks at all. Are they dipping as well? 
Uh, a little bit, not much. Really, what the story nice. today is the uh, crypto miners hit a climax top. Yesterday was a huge day. You know, MARA up 15%. HUT was up 20% or whatever. And uh, pre-market, they sold off real hard. So they've hit their temporary top. And uh, just cooling off, you know, that was inevitable because they've been on a wild rally. But uh, what I'm looking at for Bitcoin in the short term is, I guess I'll share my screen so we can. Please do. So it's on this this bounce. So two days ago, we had that little drop down. It was a pretty sizable dump. And, you know, some of the extra longs got uh, liquidated there. I should say leveraged longs. And we found a bottom with this little hourly inverse head and shoulders. So we had this. This kind of pattern there, put in the bottom to get the bounce going. And now that same thing has to happen on the four hour. And so it's, again, very similar, but we've got to see this four hour higher low set pretty soon here. And bulls need to make their way back up if we're going to see a uh, full on recovery from that drop. Otherwise, you know, and, and we can very easily chop within this range. we got the clear base of support at 40,000. We got clear resistance, 44, 45,000. We could trade within this range into the new year pretty easily. Uh, and what what altcoin bulls want to see is if we are going to trade range bound in Bitcoin, they want to see the dominance keep dropping so that, you know, altcoins keep getting their turn. But a couple of things that have happened recently, just the last couple of days that have us a little bit cautious is, you know, Litecoin got to pump up and really the laggards of the laggards, all these names that have not participated. So Link got a nice move up and Litecoin and Binance and all these names. So uh, it can it can we could break either way out of this range again, just. You know, the weekly time frame, if you don't consolidate on the weekly and you have a higher low every single week for two months, two and a half months, you just know it's inevitable. And I've been saying that for a month at this point, but uh, it just won't surprise us when it happens. I mean, do you have any thoughts on the conversation I was having with him about what might happen when we see this ETF approved? It seems like now the waters are very muddied as to what people are expecting. We have the it's going to go up 20 grand in a day, people, to the, this. here comes the 30% correction, people. Yeah, I would, I've would. i been of the of the mindset, especially if, if, again, if weekly consolidation has not happened, I expect you know the headline quick spike up and then a top. I do think it would lead to weekly consolidation, and then we would look for a weekly high or low because uh, there's tons of space for it. And again, that's inevitable consolidation that you have in any kind of uptrend. Uh, so, but then I have, you know, I, I was over the weekend... I was seeing on my timeline, like, man, everybody is so euphoric for, you know, we're going to make so much money in 2024. And so I posted that and say, anytime I see this, this makes me cautious in my, you know, 13 years of trading. This is how I avoid bag holding in euphoria markets. I sell into this kind of strength. And then I post that. And then it's one of, you know, it gets retweeted and liked and people are agreeing with me. And now I'm like, well, wait a minute. I want everyone to tell me I'm an idiot. If so I'm tell me eat. how I'm wrong yeah. or that I'm missing out on the new paradigm. Exactly. Tell me to have that fun would, staying poor, please. Like, that would no. magnify my belief that that would be the case. And so the fact that I had so many people agreeing with me had me say, well, wait a minute, maybe we can keep this going. So, uh, yeah, for me, it's always been cautious the short term in the the ETF headline reaction because, you know, I had I had a friend who's not crypt, uh, not crypto friend message me a month ago about buying for the ETF. So, you know, people retail he, you know, he knows markets, he does stocks, but uh, retail is front running this ETF, some retail. It's just a question question of, uh, I, I just can't imagine that, you know, big money has not been front running this knowing that it's a, a sell the news event in the short term. Yeah, I think, as we said before, long term, it's uh, going to be extremely bullish, but it's hard to know what's going to happen in the short term. But I'm starting to agree with you. I think you get the big pump and then we just chill for months. Right. Because we still also have the four year cycle, you know, the having coming in April. We always have a boring six to nine months after that with some correction. And then the real bull market starts, you know, in September, October after the having. I, I still don't see why that wouldn't happen personally. Yeah. I mean, this this long term chart, the four month. I mean, if we don't get the all time high and we pull back and again, just looking for what we did 2017, we just equilibrium tightening range. It was over a shorter period of time, but it was also a much smaller range. And again, I'm just very open to that happening again. And us traders, you know, if that did happen, it would be a, a good thing because it would give us nice clarity and, you know, there'd be more time for buying consolidation. And then you get the breakout and the euphoria that follows. So uh, just again, as I always say to everybody, have a game plan, 
for, for both directions. Have a game plan for Bitcoin all-time high in the next three, four months and have a game plan for a long, drawn-out tightening range for the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah. So what else are you looking at right now then in, in general? I mean, the, the miners, like you said, have gone crazy. I luckily uh, was listening to Mike Alfred not a, just a couple of weeks ago and I bought a bunch and uh, you know, <laughs> doubled or went up two and a half times in uh, just a matter of weeks. But it does feel like that run could be ending here for a little while. Yeah, it's a uh, very short term, though. I'm still very bullish on them long term. I'm not selling, by the way. I, these were like I was accumulating a low position and you know, I'm going to ride the cycle. So. Yeah, at this point, if we're talking short term, I mean, again, MARA daily higher low every single day for the last 12 days at the moment. I'm going to be watching for whether the current bounce, because again, pre-market we dumped, but I'm looking for an hourly lower high. If we confirm an hourly downtrend, that tells us, yeah, daily consolidation is underway. And then from there, we look for the back burner, first hourly oversold conditions to look for a daily higher low. And that's going to be a, a potential solid entry point, which was the case for coin. And you can see even now coin, the lower open, you know, we're, we're covering a little bit, but uh, coin first hourly oversold conditions happened back at 118. And we very quickly saw continuation in a, a, a large follow through move. So I'm looking for hourly oversold in these names to be looking for swing trade entries at this point. But again, you know, bulls aren't complaining with the buying at the moment. And they're hoping that it aligns with Bitcoin shaping up that four hour higher low. But Bitcoin definitely still has work to do on that front. I mean, Coinbase at $184, man. What a run. <laughs> yeah, that, that monthly time frame. One of the lessons for me is, you know, all these growth names just were complete bears in 2022. And then they just based out on the monthly long-term time frame for so long. And just this inverse head and shoulders, uh, you know, where, where's your resistance after these tops? It was 116 and 114. So pretty much a double top. If you clear that, there is just nothing here. And the bulls have taken full advantage of that lack of resistance. So are you watching anything else in the crypto market? Are you interested in Ethereum here? I mean, I've been obviously saying that Ethereum's beat down and trailing and that's an opportunity, but uh, not everyone agrees, but it is starting to bounce here against Bitcoin, obviously, uh, quite nicely. And I think it just put in actually a, the highest price since like May 22 or something. Let me check that. But yeah, I think, uh, yeah, but going back, you have to go back to May 22 to see it hit 24.45 or something today. Yeah, we put this ETH BTC chart. I drew this line and I just said, it's not time for ETH if this is resistance. And then obviously the last two days that has shifted significantly. So uh, ETH, you know, getting its turn, it's certainly overdue and it's just rotation. This is what bulls want to see in a healthy market. You know, I watch it in the broader market where we rotate from the Magnificent Seven to IWM and, you know, the Russell 2000, the laggards, and then the financial sector gets a turn. So it's one of the characteristics of a strong bull market when you do get that kind of rotation going on. So that's always a good sign. But uh, yeah, ETH is worth watching right now. And again, just there's still plays out there. The dump two days ago, we had you know, OP and SOL. They hit hourly oversold for the first time and had some solid bounces. So bulls are still buying dips at this point. You just got to be protective. You know, if you're playing short-term bounces, sell your partial positions into some follow through and just set your stops knowing that we will see weekly consolidation. It's just a question of when. And if you don't want to be holding into weekly consolidation, you've got to protect your positions. Yeah, I mean, my theory was that some of that Solana money will rotate into Ethereum here, just as I hear the narratives. And this is the Solana chart. I mean, this weekly candle still has three days, but that's pretty ugly. I mean, I would love, I'm bidding. I'll just tell you guys, I'm bidding Solana into like the 70s here, high 70s. You know, that was a huge, for me, weekly level. Obviously, that's where resistance was here. So that's what I'm looking at. I, I don't know that it'll get there, but that's the next area I'd be interested in buying if it is dipping. Yeah, I mean, you're on point. This chart I have up is the daily chart for Seoul divided by ETH, which shows us, you know, Seoul has been outperforming ETH for three months, and that has drastically shifted the last three days. Yeah, so good. I'm glad that then that, that aligns for you. I just, I, you, you, Eric was even talking about the most hated rallies and the most hated bull markets. It feels like ETH has just been the most hated asset. I've been writing about it constantly for the past few months. Just seems irrational. Um, so what else? I see you got MSOS up there. Is that? Uh... Yeah, just another mention cannabis. So again, if you're not following the sector at all, it's just a headline play. You know, if you're not following it, just set an alert where if the DEA reschedules cannabis, which is, you know, there's rumors around, I think they would hold it till closer to the election, but it's just an E, it's free money. If that happens, if you can market buy MSOS 
as soon as possible, it's the kind of thing that's gonna it's gonna go up for you know weeks. And so uh, it's 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 just an easy play where it's a headline play. You know, I'm a I'm a technical trader, but that's a very clear fundamental catalyst. So I'm encouraging everybody. You know, if you don't want to watch this sector, it's boring most of the time. I understand, but just have a game plan. Write down a game plan. If this headline comes out and I can act quickly on that headline, I will do X, Y, and Z. Because that's a headline that uh, lasts forever. That's it's not one of those sell the new events. That's a fundamental change in the entire way that that market will trade indefinitely. And it's so thinly traded that that so much money will pour in on that headline. Again, this this was the this was the HHS recommending that the DEA reschedule. And so you know, 100 percent in two weeks or whatever. And so if it actually happens, I'm that that would be the most aggressive that I go as a trader since you know 2017 crypto 2018. Uh, you know, Canadian cannabis run. I have, I, you know, since then I've dialed it back and been more conservative. But if that headline hits, I'm going to go right back into my most aggressive trading style. Makes perfect sense. Anything else you're looking at before I let you go? That's it for now. Metals, they had their blow off top. They're recovering a bit. You know, it's a nice, nice two week recovery. Uh, still, you know, we could easily be range bound here for a couple of weeks, but still keeping my eye just because of that proximity to all time highs for gold. Yeah. Agree. We love that uh, blue sky breakout if we ever get it. Well, everybody follow Chart Guys on X, his uh, his YouTube channel, everywhere else, man. Thank you as always for joining. I love that we like just knock it out in like 15 minutes. Everything there is to know, everything you need to know. Then we come back a week later and see how we did. Usually pretty well. <laughs> All right, Scott. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, Dad. All right, everybody. Once again, please uh, like and subscribe and subscribe. See, when I get my producer back, I get little notes that say, dude, ask people to subscribe to the channel, man. What is wrong with you? I'm bad at it. And while we're doing that, subscribe to my free newsletter, The Wolf Den. It's right down below. You guys should know about this by now. If you're not reading this, but you're watching my my things, I, I find it kind of weird, honestly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it up here. Uh, I think I don't even know how to use the internet guys. I'm trying to, I'm trying to like bring it up. I can't even do it. That's how bad I am at interneting. I think this should be it though. Let's see. Yeah, you can see guys. I'm on newsletter today. I wrote my 872nd <laughs> newsletter five days a week. I wake up first thing in the morning, four or five o'clock, check the market, check the news, write this. You know, I mean, 872 of them. I've written like a full set of encyclopedias on this market. And it's a great way to hold myself accountable, to do the research, to, you know, really be on top of it and to know that I'm not just uh, talking out of my ass by the time I get on YouTube. So, yeah, there you go, guys. It's free. It's free. It's the wolfden.substack.com. Go subscribe to it. Otherwise, I'm assuming I haven't talked to Nathaniel. I'll be back tomorrow regardless. Hopefully, it will be the Friday Five, which is a, always a great way to summarize everything that's happened in the week and review all of that. That's what, oh, wait, is it? Is it uh, Drew's birthday? Scott has a birthday special for me. I'll just get it free. Scott, it's Drew's birthday. Happy birthday, Drew. I hope a lot of people bought uh, Bitcoin hoodies from you when we uh, shilled the shit out of your store here last two weeks ago. Hope that worked. All right, guys, that's all I got for you. I will see you tomorrow. Peace. That's dope.